Welcome to the 40th annual Bloom's Day celebration. Thank you, Mick, for starting off the proceedings. The 16th of June, Bloom's Day, is celebrated all over the world as the day James Joyce's Ulysses takes place in Dublin in 1904. Thanks to Mick and friends, Oxford has had a Bloom's Day event on this night every year since 1980. And tonight, despite lockdown, coronavirus and the sad state of the world, we will celebrate for a couple of hours, as Mick has said, the 40th anniversary of the Joyce Night in Oxford. Some of you will know me, some of you will not. I'm Bernadette, and I will be reading to you later this evening. I believe my first Oxford Joyce Night was 35 years ago in the Wheat Sheaf. I miss the early years at the Roebuck, but have enjoyed many a Joyce Night since at the Asian Centre, the Half Moon, the Port Mahone and the White House. Tonight we come to you courtesy of Zoom. Not a bad venue, though we've certainly known better. First, I'd like to give you a hint of the treats in store for you tonight and also to let you know that this event will be available virtually and eternally at the link you joined on should you need a break or to recap or indeed multiple doses. So coming up tonight, uh, in no particular order, as they say, will be music, song and readings from... Nick Hooper, Theresa Moran, Bernard O'Donoghue, Mick Kavanagh, Tom Paulin, Gerald Garcia, Terry Eagleton, myself, Keith Hopper, Pam Cooper and John Petticker, Kate and Brian Patterson, John Rayner and Isaac, Iggy McGovern, Patrick O'Reilly, Eamon Flanagan, and assorted Henrys, including Anna, Anthony and, of course, Mick. So uh, thank you all for sharing this evening with us. And now relax and enjoy. Um, and as Mick always quotes in anticipation of an evening's entertainment, spend an evening with us at an elegant, gorgeous affray. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Michael Kavanagh. Um calling in from London. Um, I first started going to Bloomsday in Oxford in the 80s and I just loved it and all the other musical events that Mick Henry and Byrne and so on, other friends the evening put on in the year. Um, it got me playing um, music, in particular tenor banjo. Um, Mick was very gracious in lending me one and now it's one of my best hobbies. The neighbours won't thank you for it. Um, anyway, I was in touch with the organisers just to check whether anything could be done this year because I, I really wanted to make a point of getting up there, having reconnected the event in the last few years, and um, was told there would be an attempt to do something online. And um, I was asked if I could, because I think I might be the person closest to the Irish Embassy in London, um, to go and collect a letter from the Irish Ambassador to Britain, um, who actually has taken the time to just write... Um, some thoughts just in appreciation of the efforts of um, the Friends of Bloomsday over the years. So I'm going to read that out. OK, so this is a message from Ambassador Adrian O'Neill on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Oxford's Bloomsday. He says, June the 16th is a day of commemorations of one of Ireland's most famous exiles, the literary icon James Joyce. Wherever you find Irish people with a passion for words throughout the world, you will find them celebrating this day, the fictional date on which Leopold Bloom made his epic journey through the streets of Dublin. Indeed, I know here in Britain there are a number of planned initiatives to mark the day immortalised in Ulysses. I am delighted to extend my best wishes to Oxford's Bloom's Day celebration on this, occasion, on this especially auspicious occasion, which marks the 40th anniversary of the event. It is also Oxford Bloomsday's first celebration in this new socially distant but virtually connected space. 
While different in character, I have no doubt it will be equally impactful. Over the years, many scholars, writers and artists have taken part in Oxford's Bloomsday. This year, the writers Terry Eagleton, Tom Paulin, E. McGovern, Keith Hopper and Bernard O'Donoghue are participating in the programme, as well as musicians Gerald Garcia and Nick Hooper. Their contributions will certainly enrich the offering, and I look forward to enjoying at least some of them from a virtual perspective. Oxford Bloomsdays would not have happened without the dedication, organisation, musical energy and literary spirit of Mr Michael Mick Henry. Mick deserves enormous credit for promoting a successful Bloomsday each year. In sustaining the event for so many years, the following extract from Ulysses will no doubt resonate with Mick. The year returns, history repeats itself. You crags and peaks, I'm with you once again. Congratulations, Mick, and thank you for your devotion to building and anchoring a vibrant cultural life in Oxford. To everyone in Britain and around the globe who are part participating in the Joycean occasion, I wish you a happy Bloomsday. Berbua August Bunnacht, Adrian O'Neill, Irish Ambassador to London. I say cheers to that. Myself, I'd be in Arne Coon, where the mountain stands away, and it's I would watch the sun go in the cuckoo's glen above the bay. Agasa Kakera Ligaso, Hera Londa Vagaso, tis the quiet land of Erin. Oh, my heart is weary all alone, and it sends out lonely cries to the land that seems beyond my dreams, and the lonely Sundays pass me by. Agasa Kakera Aligaso, Era Londa Vagaso, tis the quiet land of Erin. I would ravel back the twisted years in the bitter wasted winds if the God above would let me lie in the quiet place above the winds. Hagasa kakera ligaso, era londa vagaso, tis the quiet land of Erin. Myself, I'd be in Ardney Coon, where the mountain stands away, and tis I would watch the sun go in the cuckoo's glen above the bay. Agasa Kakera Ligaso, Eralanda Vagaso, tis the quiet land of Erin. I'm hoping you can hear me and the Belfast accent isn't too abrasive. Uh, Mick organised this gr great Irish um, uh, literary and cultural festival uh, for I think about 10 years in Oxford and um, all sorts of people came. I remember um, talking to Seamus Heaney with, with Mick a long time ago uh, and it was a great event, R really marvellous. 
And um, I saw a, a lot of Mick and I've been in touch uh, recently to find out how he is. And he's always very convivial, uh, great um, uh, network of, of, of friends, um, very radical in the, his views, uh, with a rather aesthetic view of the English um, working man, I think. Um, so that, that, that's my memory of him. Um, and um, he used to organize, we went round, um, um, people would sing and read poems in various places near Oxford and in um, pubs in, in Oxford. And I always, uh, well, I, I, I would read poems and I'd read a bit of Joyce. I usually read standing up, but I better sit down. Um, um, at these events, um, um, I always read Yeats's greatest poem, uh, Sailing to Byzantium. I'll do my best. That is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas. Fish, flesh or fowl commend all summer long. Whatever is begotten, born and died. Caught in that sensual music all neglect. Monuments of an aging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing. A tattered coat upon a stick unless so clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I've sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, pern in a jar, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal. It knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enamelling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Hello folks from the East, that's East Oxford. Greetings to all our friends on this virtual Bloomsday. Many thanks to the Henrys for putting this together. Hi Mick, here's a piece.
my gentle heart. Hello everyone, happy Bloomsday. Thanks to Mick Henry and Bernard Donoghue for keeping the flag flying all of these years. Here's a piece from the Gospel according to Miles Nagopoling, which I know is one of Mick's favourites. The Miles Nagopoling Catechism a Cliche, in 356 tri-weekly parts, a unique compendium of all that is nauseating in contemporary writing, compiled without regard to expense or the feelings of the public, a harrowing survey of sub-literature and all that is pseudo maledicted and calloused in the underworld of print, given free with the Irish Times. It's not be sold separately or exported without a license. Irish Labour, Irish Inc. Part 1, Section 1. Let her out, Mike. Lights. OK, Sullivan, let her ride. Is a man ever hurt in a motor crash? No, he sustains an injury. Does such a man ever die from his injuries? No, he succumbs to them. Correct. But supposing an ambulance is sent for him. He's put into the ambulance and rushed to the hospital. Is he dead when he gets there, assuming he's not alive? No, he's not dead. Life is found to be extinct. Correct again. Final question. Did he go into the hospital or enter it or be brought to it? He did not. He was admitted to it. Good. That'll do for today. Next day. The Miles and Goblin Catechism and Cliche Part 2. Copyright, of course. What's more, all rights reserved. Reproduction in whole or part, etc, etc. Is treatment, particularly bad treatment, ever given to a person? No, it is always meted out. Is anything else ever meted out? No, the only thing that is ever meted out is treatment. And what does the meeting out of treatment evoke? The strongest protest against the treatment meted out. Correct. Mention under a particularly revolting locution. The matter will fall to be dealt with by so-and-so. Good. Are you sufficiently astute to invent a sentence where this absurd jargon will be admissible? Yes. The incendiary bombs will fall to be dealt with by firefighting squads. Very good indeed. Is that enough for one day? It is be the japers. Next day. What we all want is a good long walk in the country, plenty of fresh air and good wholesome food. This murder of my beloved English language is getting under my nails. There are, of course, other branches of charnel house fun under which I have not yet had the courage to lead my readers. Not quite cliches, but things that smell the same and worse, far worse. Things like this, I mean. Of course, gin is a very depressing drink. The air in Bundoran is very bracing. You'll see the whole lot of us travelling by air before you're much older. Your man is an extraordinary genius. Of course, the most depressing drink of the lot is gin. Do you see what I'm driving at? Can you visualise the list of dirty, pale, goading phrases with which I may, yes, regale you next week? What? I beg your pardon? Well, that isn't my fault. I merely record what goes on around me. I just write down what goes on. One last uh, of the columns. What happens to blows at a council meeting? It looks as if they might be exchanged. What does pandemonium do? It breaks loose. Describe its subsequent dominion. It rains. How are allegations dealt with? Hotly. What is the mean temperature of an altercation, therefore? Heated. What is the behaviour of a heated altercation? It follows. What happens to order? It is restored. Alternatively, and what does the meeting break up? Disorder. What does the meeting do in disorder? It breaks up. In what direction does the meeting break in disorder? Up. In what direction should I shut?
Hello, it's Brian and Kate Pattinson here. We have been friends with Mick for many, many years. He sang at our wedding in 1974 with the wonderful Tom McNicholas and alongside was Tyg Foley. So we're here to say uh, to hello and uh, to remember you all. We haven't been to many Joyce nights in the last few years, but we were there at the beginning in Oxford and for at least the first five or six. It was an ad hoc affair under the magic touch of, magic he um, of Mick Henry, the spirit of Ireland in Oxford. Any of us who heard Mick sing in those days was lucky. We were lucky to hear traditional songs sung lyrically and authentically, unaccompanied, and also to hear the funny songs Mick unearthed and remembered every word of, in spite of them being many, many verses long. There will never be anyone like Mick in Oxford again. At Mick's right hand always was Father, Herb Father Herbert McCabe with his rousing rendition of Avanti Popolo and Tom McNicholas on accordion, Mick's old friend from Mayo. Others we remember from back then... <laughs> Uh, Terry Eagleton, of course, with his satirical songs. Tom Paulin, Maura, and her wonderful parents, John and Pat Hanrahan. Barry Reardon singing Finnegan's Wake. Danny and Isabel. Big Pat, Short Pat, actually called Paddy Short from Cross McGlynn. Brian and Kathy. Tony the Fiddler. Bernard and Heather O'Donoghue. And the one who, the one Mick always called Patsy Denning of the Rolls. <laughs> we remember the year Richard Ellman, great Joyce scholar, played us, paid us a visit and read from Ulysses. Subsequently, his daughter Lucy supported. And did she read the soliloquy? Many of these people are dead now. Some may even have been dead before the first Joyce night. We can't remember. <laughs> but it was a great time to be among the Irish in Oxford. Many years ago, I called the Ballad of James Joyce. Uh, well, now who'd be taught by Jesuits unless you had no choice? But that's the fate that lay in store for little Jimmy Joyce. Well, they lashed him and they smashed him, though he could hardly see, until he turned around and said, Two fingers, Lord, to thee, and well, it's bloom, boys, bloom. Bloom I'd like to see, tucked up in bed with the sweet Molly. For you haters and you baiters, and folk like you and me, made his life a hell in the south country. Well, Jim's daddy was a drinking man who idolized Parnell, but his mammy was a pious lass who lived in fear of hell. But neither hell nor Parnell struck Jimmy as much cop, compared with no rabbinical, but there I'd better stop. Well, he had a spree at UCD proclaiming imps and trumps Till pious professors landed him some spiritual thumps You're a traitor to your country, sir, and your religion too And Jimmy turned and growled again, two fingers, sirs, to you What with clerics and Sinn Feiners, our Jim was in a mess so he upped and off to Paris and to Zurich and Trieste. With love and hate for Ireland at war within his heart, he knew what can't be done in life can still be on in art. So he settled down in Trieste town, produced a mighty tome. It's all about two fellas, one a Jew and one ex-Rome, and a buxom lass called Molly, who's quite a little duck. But the High Court didn't like the way she kept on saying Bloom, boys, bloom. Well, one day there came his way a catchy tune from Dublin town About a man called Finnegan who's dead but won't lie down uh, Jimmy said to Nora, now the air is rather rough 
But it would make a dandy bit of writing, sure enough. So he took ten tons of paper and twenty quarts of ink. And he took the Oxford Dictionary and flushed it down the sink. And he wrote the queerest book, friends, that you'll ever find. Two sentences are quite enough to make you blow your mind. Well, it's mostly about this woman called Anna Plurabell. But it might be about Marzi Tung, for all that I can tell. It's the book of books, the myth of myths. It's really rather fun. It's the English language roll into one great enormous pun. Well, since Jim went to heaven, his fate's been sad indeed. He's the finest Irish genius that nobody can read. But he took old Ireland by the scruff and put her on the map. And there's none of your Sinn Féin as can say better friends than that. Well, it's Bloom, boys, Bloom. Bloom I'd like to see tucked up in bed with his sweet Molly. For you haters and you baiters and folk like you and me made his life a hell in the South Country. In the early days of Mix Bloomsday festivals in Oxford, um, Richard Elman, the great biographer of Joyce, came uh, for the first six years, came to all the um, the events. And each year he read the same famous passage from Ulysses, which is the uh, the citizen passage when Bloom makes his great kind of um, anti-intolerance speech. I can't read it as well as Elman, but uh, this is it. Bloom was talking and talking with John Wise, and he quite excited with his dundockety mud-coloured mug on him and his old plum eyes rolling about. Persecution, says he, all the history of the world is full of it, perpetuating national hatred among nations. But do you know what a nation is, says John Wise. Yes, says Bloom. What is it, says John Wise. A nation, says Bloom. A nation is the same people living in the same place. By God then, says Ned, laughing, if that's so, I'm a nation, for I'm living in the same place for the last five years. So, of course, everyone had a laugh at Bloom, and says he, trying to mock out of it, or also living in different places. That covers my case, says Joe. What is your nation, if I may ask, says the citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here. Ireland. The citizen said nothing, only cleared the spit out of his gullet and gob. He spat a red bank oyster out of him right in the corner. Shove us over the drink, said I. Which is which? That's mine, said Joe, as the devil said to the dead policeman. And I belong to a race too, says Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant. Robbed, says he, plundered, insulted, persecuted taking what belongs to us by right. At this very moment, says he, putting up his fist, sold by auction off in Morocco like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem, says the citizen? I'm talking about injustice, says Bloom. Right, says John Wise. Stand up to it then with force like men. But it's no use, says Bloom. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women, insult and hatred. And everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that. It is really life. What? says Alf. Love, says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. I must go now, he says to John Wise, just round to the court to see if Martin's there. If he comes, just say I'll be back in a second. Just a moment. Who's hindering you? And off he pops, like greased lightning. Two tunes, ladies and gentlemen, for a very strange Bloomsday. Bloomsday 2020. The Coolin, first of all. <laughs>
and that was with uh, Isaac on bass, cardboard bass guitar. And here he is. Electric guitar. In leader of the second violins in a tune called uh, Peeler's Jig. Here are eyes. Are you ready? This is Isaac's debut for Bloomsday. Okay, so three times. One, two, one, two, okay. Okay, Peeler's Jig. Thank you very much. See, bow eyes it. Thank you very much. Hi, Biggie McGovern here in lockdown Dublin. Delighted to be joining the virtual uh, Bloomsday event in Oxford. In 1998, I was in cultural lockdown in Magdalen College in Oxford, and I achieved something there, which I thought I never would. I finished Ulysses. How did I do it? Carrot and stick, mostly carrot. I tried drink, disaster, and I hit on the idea of allowing myself to write a poem based on each chapter as I finished the chapter. So, fingers on the mute buttons, here are 18 you limericks. Buck Mulligan, plump and stately, rags Stephen whose mum's R.I.P. The tires a kip, Buck goes for a dip, in the scrotum tightening sea. Sir Stephen shows weary regard for someone who finds sums too hard. His foot in his mouth, old DC's uncouth, to our bullock befriending bard. Ineluctable modality, plus a shaggy dog fatality. A bilingual rant, la plume de ma tante, a nose picking finality. Inner organs of beasts and fowls, a letter from blazes, bloom skulls, its import denied. A kidney is fried, an effortless movement of bowels. A letter from Martha, Bloom's joy, is tempered by meeting McCoy. No rent for the Pope, by lotion and soap, a flower for one naughty boy. A road race to quicken the dead, and put Paddy Dagnum to bed. Parnell, the old fox, is not in his box. He died of... A Tuesday, tis said. Fresh from omnium gatherums of Nelson's and Freeman's columns, our Stephen is led to the boozing shed by the parable of the plums. While gastronome Leopold spurns the burton for chic Davy Burns, Gorgonzola and red wine gone to the head to the library by about turns, where Stephen has taken the floor to lecture on cold Elsinore. The last will is read on second best bed, then exeunt all out the door. Father Conmey, the Dagnan boy, and the Dublin hoy polloi, crisscross in the street some dead lie meet, all strain to salute the Viceroy. Two barmaids discuss cons and pros of marriage to the greasy nose. By cider and powers there's more talk of flowers and somebody sings the last rose. The heroes of Ireland crowd in the court of R.M. Citizen. 
Maligned as a cheat, Bloom's forced to retreat, pursued by a dog bisted tin. While Gertie conceives of astriction, the strains of retreat benediction cross Sandy Mount Strand, self-taken in hand, Bloom limply can mark her affliction. A visit to Mrs Purefoy. The medics press Bloom to enjoy full many a glass of number one bass to Burke's at the news of a boy. Night's dream about women and wine, enlivened by costume design. The leg of a duck earns Stephen a puck. The horse has the neigh saying line. A refuge from sissies and malt. The cabman's night shelter, their halt. SD will have none of coffee and bun, nor bloom the tall tales of some salt. Bloom Keyless climbs over the gate. Relief as they co-urinate. Tell tale potted meat on fresh linen sheet where it blazes has shifted his weight. Now Molly's awake in the bed with lots of bad thoughts in her head. To finish, she'll say, sure, fine, right, okay. Henceforth, you can take that as red. Happy Bloomsday! Thanks for uh, inviting me to join in the Bloomsday celebration. I'm going to play a piece um, by O'Carolan called uh, Lament for Owen Roe O'Neill, a great Irish hero. <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you. 
you may strain your muscles to brag of Brussels, of London, Paris, or Timbuktu, Constantinople, or Sebastopol, Vienna, Naples, or Tonga, Taboo, of Copenhagen, Madrid, Kilbegan, or the capital of the Russian Tsar. They're all inferior to the vast superior and gorgeous city of Mullingar. That fair metropolis, so fair and populous, adorns the regions of sweet west meat. That fertile county, which nature's bounty has richly gifted with bog and heat. Them scenes so charming, where snipes are swarming, attracts the sportsman that comes from far. And whoever wishes can catch fine fishes in deep Loch Owl near Mullingar. I could stray forever by Brosna's river, or watch her waters in their sparkling fall. Would gander swimming and gaily skimming, or the crisp bosom of the Royal Canal, or on Thursdays wander mid pigs so tender, with geese and turkeys on many a car, exchanging pleasantry with the grand old peasantry that throng the market at Mullingar. E nine inspire me, and with raptures fire me, to sing the buildings both old and new, the majestic courthouse, the spacious workhouse, the church and steeple that adorn the view. Then there's barracks airy for the military, where the bravery pours from the toil a war, five schools and honourly in a thriving tannery in the gorgeous city of Mullingar. The railway station with admiration I next must mention in terms of praise, where trains are rolling, where the engines howl and strikes each beholder with wild amaze. Then there's the main street, the broad and clean street, with its laws of gas lamps that shine afar. Sure I could speak a lecture on the architecture of the gorgeous city of Mullingar. <coughs> The men of genius contemporaneous approach spontaneous this favoured spot, where good society and great variety of entertainment is still their lot. The neighbouring quality for hospitality and conviviality unequalled are, and from December until November there's still diversion in Mullingar. Now, in conclusion, I make allusion to the gorgeous females that here abound, celestial creatures with lovely features and taper rankle to skim the ground. But this suspends me the theme trans sends me my muses powers are too weak be far. It would take a tallest likewise Tybullus to sing the praises of Yes, this is a famous love poem to Maud Gaon or about Maud Gaon. The Cold Heaven Suddenly I saw the cold and rook-delighting heaven that seemed as though ice burned and was but the more ice. And thereupon imagination and heart were driven, so wild that every casual thought of that and this vanished and left but memories that should be out of season with the hot blood of youth, of love crossed long ago. And I took all the blame out of all sense and reason until I cried and trembled and rocked to and fro, riddled with light. Ah, when the ghost begins to quicken, confusion of the deathbed over is its scent, out naked on the roads, as the books say, and stricken by the injustice of the skies for punishment. Yes, we're just about to celebrate wonderful 40 years Himself and Mick and all lovely people who were there and contributed to the Joyce Nights in the background and in the front ground, musicians and singers and what have you. 40 years of wonderful music and a great tribute to Mick in keeping it going all those years through the sake of sin. And it will be wonderful to celebrate that with him. Okay, God bless. And another 40 years, maybe. <laughs>
I am a lowly cabin man, and soft ways of my manner. I was raised up in the rushes along the shores of Gauna, and to marry and to settle there it was my one ambition. How hard I tried to find a bride, I just met with frustration. I caught it up and down the land from Coot Hill up to Arva, from Virginia to Cavan Town, and some days even further. O'Connor, oh, the matchmaker, was driven to distraction, for when it came to finding love, I could get no satisfaction. Well, the first one that he matched for me, it was the widow Hegarty. She had to find big legacy, of that there was no doubt, for she had seven cows in every field, and each one had a high milk yield. She seemed to me to be ideal, but she didn't think the same. For when O'Connor fixed the meat, a cup of tea and a bite to eat, we found the note pinned to the gate, and this is what it said. Oh, Sean, I hope you'll understand. I've sold my cattle and my land. I'm living it up in Monaghan. Her address was not enclosed. Well, I danced with Mary Brady, who I met down at a Cayley. She seemed a decent lady. Alas, there's more to tell, for her manner was quite urgent. She proved to be insolvent, having only left the convent to waltz away to hell. That night she almost caused a scene, suggesting things I found obscene. A novice who was far from green, I think it's safe to say. And as my mind began to flail, I said she'd gone beyond the pale. I went and got her coat and veil, and I sent her on her way. I courted Maggie Riley, who was thought of very highly, and we seemed to suit ideally, and I thought she felt the same. But then, alas, to my big fright, she disappeared one windy night. They discovered her exhausted bike abandoned in the lane. So, like a fox before the hound, I thought it best to go to ground. I packed my bags for Longford Town to live in exile there. Well, I earned my keep in cutting rails, in driving vans and loading bales, still chasing girls to no avail, and with discontentment rising, I said, what's the point of living here? Ten barren years of deep despair, for still I've not had a sniff of a mare, and I'm missing Gowner's shores. So, fifteen years, no more to roam, I went back to my Gowner home. I put an ad in Island Zone, and this is what I said. O oh, Cavan man, devout R.C., N.S.T.T. and H.G.V. Seeks girl 18 to 63, ex-nuns need not apply. So daily then I took my stock with one eye peeled upon the clock, waiting for the postman's knock, alas, it never came. So there I was all alone down in my little cabin home, a stallion that never sired a foal, the man who missed the last train from Drumhauna, and so to Maynooth I made my way. I joined up at a seminary, and this is how I come to be the parish priest of Gona. Amen. Um, uh, there are very strict rules about um, about protocol um, in musical gatherings, and uh, Irish ones anyway. There's a there's a book by um, Kieran Carson called Irish Traditional Music, which tells you when you can offer your services. You know, when you can <laughs> when you can say uh, I, can, I can play as well. Do my, I brought my fiddle? That kind of thing. You can't do that. You have to wait for about six months before you're before you're asked. Um, and in the course of the protocols, the end of this book, he. Um, he, he describes a, a fiddle competition because, of course, it can also be very rivalrous. That's the other, <laughs> the other great quality. <coughs> the fiddle competition. There was this fiddle competition once upon a time, and there were three fiddle players in for it. The first fiddle player came up. He was dressed in a dress suit. He was wearing a white shirt and a dicky bow, and he was carrying a crocodile skin fiddle case. And when he brought out the fiddle, what was it but a Stradivarius? He started to play, and by God, he was useless. <laughs> the second fiddle player came up. 
He was dressed in a three-piece lounge suit and a matching shirt and tie. He had a nice mahogany fiddle case and a good fiddle. He rosined the bow and he drew it across the strings and we got he was useless. <laughs> so, the third fiddle player came up. He had now battered shiny blue suit and there was no collar to his shirt. His toes were peeping out from his shoes and the fiddle case was held together with bits of string. He brought out the fiddle and there were more strings on the fiddle than there were on the bow. Mm -hmm. He started to play and because he was useless too. <laughs> <laughs> This song is called The Banks of the Ban. When first unto this country a stranger I came, I gave my affection to a maid that was young. Her being fair and tender, her waist small and slender, Kind fortune had formed her for my overthrow. By the banks of the ban, it was there I first met her. She appeared like a jewel, or Egypt's fair queen. Her eyes, they were like diamonds, or the stars sweetly shining. She's the fairest of all in this fine world I've seen. But it was her cruel parents that first caused our variance because she was rich and above my degree. But I'll do my best endeavor to win my love's favor, although she is come of a grand family. Well, my name it is Delaney, it's a name that won't shame me, and if I had saved money, I'd never have roamed. But drinking and courting, like gambling and sporting, are the cause of my ruin and my absence from home. If I had all the riches that there were in the Indies, I'd put rings on her fingers and gold in her ears. And there beside the banks of the lovely Ban River, in all kinds of splendor, I would live with my dear. I would like to read you a passage from one of Mick's favorite books. In fact, I think probably his favorite book of all times. Uh, which is Woodbrook by David Thompson. So I'll read you a passage from uh, the beginning of the book when David Thompson first arrives at Woodbrook. As I walked on the pastures of Woodbrook, watching the horses graze on that first day, I observed many low curved undulations of the turf, straight and regularly spaced, the valleys between them three feet apart, the ridges sloping upwards with the hill, never across it, all obviously made by men. But it did not occur to me for years that they were potato beds abandoned with their rotten crop by the starving people who fled or died in the Great Famine 85 years before. And when I met the Maxwell brothers who lived with their parents on Woodbrook Farm and worked there, I did not know that they were the great-great-grandchildren of the only survivors in that townland, nor that their little house had been one of 30 at that time, each standing in its own plot of several acres, 
every one of which except theirs had been pulled down in the years of the famine. Nor that they felt ashamed because they knew why their house had been spared. Nor that they secretly cherished hatred for the Major, their present landlord and employer, whom in day-to-day -day relationships they loved. But they cherished this hatred because of his ancestors and theirs, and because it might help their advancement. I think of these examples, one lodged in the soil and the other in the mind, because they led me gradually beneath the surface of the soil and mind. My own mind was then always on the surface of what I saw or heard, and I owned nothing durable except a watch, which soon fell into the lake. It was years before I understood what land means to a peasant people, that love of it can be more jealous than love of a woman, and more steadfast because it is embedded in the past. None of my friends thought much about possessions. One had a car, it is true, and one a motor bicycle. But these they treated like toys, to be swapped or sold at a whim. My feeling for Woodbrook was more like friendship than love, and now as I look back, I can see that it began unconsciously like friendship. When two people meet and take to each other, they start gradually to uncover one another's past, and the slower the process, the deeper the friendship becomes. It is like falling in love without the torment, and although you do not find each other layer by layer, in the archaeologist way, you see, after months or years, a whole being who contains his past and present merged with the lives of his forebears. You see the whole of him, and he sees you. The present surface always near, and the layers of the past melted into one. In modern history, the layers are jumbled in the ground and the buildings and in the minds of the people. Now this is a companion piece I wrote to the Joyce Ballad. It's called The Ballad of Woolly Yates. Well, I'll tell you the tale of the bold Irish bars who feared that old Ireland was Europe's backyard. So he donned a cravat, wrote a lyric or two, like a cross between Byron and Brian Baru. To Rio, to Rie. Well, from Sligo to Soho is quite a long way. Well, the Irish were growing quite shamelessly sane, preferring potatoes to fierce Coppolane. They didn't know much about mythology, but they knew that old stink of the ascendancy. So he tramped across bargain, through field and through mire, crying out with the shopkeeper, in with the squire, let's have a loyal peasantry crippled and crazed, and I'll have more gun if McBride mends his ways. But the Irish were deaf to this mystical wit, in England a gale and in Ireland a Brit, Twixt Twaddle and Thompson gone they made their choice, You're a tiresome old Egypt, said young Jimmy Joyce. They booed sings the playboy clean off from the stage, Which plunged poor old Will in rhetorical rage, If you can't see I'm Cahullan arisen to power, Then piss off to your hovels, I'll live in a tower. So he slouched back to Sligo to be born again, and he wrote about horsemen and old Crazy Jane, and a strange mystic book which is brilliant, no doubt. I teach it each year, but I can't work it out. Around that stone tower irregulars trod, but Willie was busy communing with God. He was thinking of many a mystical lark, with your bold Lady Gregory back in Cool Park. The Civil War ended, it was Willie's fate to enter the Senate of the far from free state. But black shoes and black suits never fitted him well, so in blue shirt and jack boots he marched off to hell. 
He lies neath Ben Bulban, where you can descry on his tombstone these words, saying, Cast a cold eye upon life, upon death, which, when cunningly read, means the bastard won't even admit that he's dead. To Ryu, to Rie. well, from Sligo to Soho is quite a long way. I'd like to read to you a poem which featured in John Huston's film of James Joyce's short story, The Dead. The poem is called Donal Oak. It is late last night, the dog was speaking of you. The snipe was speaking of you in her deep marsh. It is you are the lonely bird through the woods and that you may be without a mate until you find me. You promised me, and you said a lie to me, that you would be before me where the sheep are flocked. I give a whistle and three hundred cries to you, and I find nothing there but a bleating lamb. You promised me a thing that was hard for you, a ship of gold under a silver mast, twelve towns with a market in all of them and a fine white court by the side of the sea. You promised me a thing that is not possible, that you would give me gloves of the skin of a fish and you would give me shoes of the skin of a bird and a suit of the dearest silk in Ireland. It was on that Sunday I gave my love to you, the Sunday that is before Easter Sunday, and myself on my knees reading the Passion, and my two eyes giving love to you forever. My mother has said to me not to be talking with you today, or tomorrow, or on the Sunday. It was a bad time she took for telling me that, it was shutting the door after the house was robbed. You have taken the east from me. You have taken the west from me. You have taken what is before me and what is behind me. You have taken the moon. You have taken the sun from me. And my fear is great that you have taken God from me.
Joyce's father came from Cork, like the best people. Um, and in one episode in The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Stephen Dedalus, who's not always that kind about his father, goes with his father, Simon Dedalus, uh, back to Cork um, and walk along the Mardyke and go through the grounds of UCC and so on. And um, Simon Dedalus, who, as Terry Eagleton's song says, was a drinking man who idolised Parnell, was also a great singer like... Um, uh, like Joyce's father and like Joyce himself. And he sings um, a well-known song, a well-known song uh, from Cork, um, Love is Pleasing. And at the end of it, with, with a, a rare compliment, um, Stephen says to his father, that's much prettier than any of your other commodities. Do you think so? asked Mr Dedalus. I like it, said Stephen. And this is it. It needs a better singer. Yeah. Tis youth and folly that make young men marry, so here, my love, I'll no longer stay. What can't be cured, sure, must be endured, sure, and so I'm bound for a merry Kay. My love, she is handsome, and my love, she's bonny. She's like good whiskey when it is new. But when it is old and growing cold, it fades and dies like the morning dew. I left my father and I left my mother. I left all my sisters and brothers too. I left all my friends and my kind relations. I left them all to go with you. But the sweetest apple is the soonest rotten, and the hottest love is the soonest cold. Oh, what can't be cured, love, has to be endured, love. And so at last we must all grow old. <coughs> For love is pleasing, and love is teasing, and love is a pleasure when first it's new. But as it grows older, sure the love grows colder, and it fades and dies like the morning dew. I'd just like to read the last lines of Joyce's final novel, Finnegan's Wake, which was published in 1939. The words are spoken by Anna Livia Plorabella, the female personification of the River Liffey, as she winds her way down to the sea. And at the very end, the dawn comes up, Joyce's great dream of the night is over, and Anna Livia disappears mid-sentence. I am passing out. Oh, bitter ending. I'll slip away before they're up. They'll never see, nor know, nor miss me. And it's old and old, it's sad and old, it's sad and weary I go back to you, my cold father, my cold mad father, my cold mad fairy father, till the near sight of the mere size of him, the miles and miles of it, moaning and moaning, make me see salt sick and I rush my only into your arms. I see them rising, save me from those terrible prongs. Two more, one, two, Mormons, more, so, Avalava. My leaves have drifted from me, all but one cling still. I'll bear it on me to remind me of. If so soft this morning, ours, yes, carry me along, Taddy, like you done through the toy fair. If I seen him bearing down on me now under white spread wings, like he'd come from archangels, I think I'd die down over his feet, humbly dumbly, only to wash up. Yes, Tid, there's where, first, we pass through grass, be hushed the bush to wish. A gull, gulls, far calls, coming far, end here, us then, fin again. Take, softly he, me memory me, till thousands the lips, the keys to, given, away, alone, a last, a loved, along the...
Hello, uh, this song tells about some of the hazards of servant life in Dublin. It's called Courtin' in the Kitchen. Come, single bell and bow, unto me pay attention. Don't ever fall in love, tis the devil's own invention. Once I fell in love with a maiden so bewitching, Miss Henrietta Bell out of Captain Kelly's kitchen. With me to Ralura la, me to Ralura laddie, me to Ralura la, to Ralura la laddie. At the age of seventeen, I was apprenticed to a grocer, not far from Stephen's Green, where Miss Henry used to go, sir. Her manners were sublime, she set me heart a twitching. She invited me to a hoolie in the kitchen with me to Ralura la, me to Ralura laddie, me to Ralura la, to Ralura la laddie. That Sunday being the day we were to have the flare up, well I dressed myself quite gay and I frizzed and all me hair up. The captain had no wife, sure he had gone out fishing, so we kicked up my life down below stairs in the kitchen with me to Ralura la, me to Ralura laddie, me to Ralura la, to Ralura la laddie. With me arms around her waist, she slyly hinted marriage. To the door in dreadful haze came Captain Kelly's carriage. She jumped from off me knee, full five feet up and higher. Over head and heels threw me slap into the fire. With me to Ralura la, me to Ralura laddie, me to Ralura la, to Ralura la laddie. Well, I grieve to see me clothes all smeared in certain ashes. When a tub of dirty suds right in my face, she dashes. We knew repealer's coat that I got from Mr. Mitchell with a twenty shilling note. Went to blazes in that kitchen with me to Ralura la, me to Ralura laddie, me to Ralura la, to Ralura la laddie. Well, the captain had no choice, though he saw my situation. For assault I was indicted and taken to the station. She said I robbed the house in spite of all her scritching. So I got six months hard for me curtain in the kitchen. With me to Ralura la, me to Ralura laddie, me to Ralura la, to Ralura la laddie. OK, folks, as we come towards the end of the evening, I hope you've got all your glasses charged and uh, drink a, a toast to Leopold Bloom. Um, I want to say a few words of appreciation quickly, principally of Mick Henry, who has organised and run the Oxford Bloomsday celebrations for 40 years and who has also been his principal contributor with his incomparable singing and his skill on the tin whistle and banjo. We should also acknowledge tonight's contributors, all of whom have been actively involved with the Bloomsday celebrations here for several years. It's traditional to say at this point, many of whom have come great distance, but of course that is both less and more, more true than usual this year. Um, 
I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the wider impact of Make Henry to Irish cultural life in Oxford over the past half century. There can't be anyone who has enriched the lives of so many people in so many ways as Mick has. He's brought people of all kinds, musicians, literary figures, everything, painters, photographers. We've had Richard Elman, Christy Moore, the Tolly Killy Band, John Minahan, Seamus Heaney, Liam O'Goflin, Evan Boland, James Simmons, Dolores Keane, Jackie Daly, Artie McGlynn, Tony McMahon, Paul Muldoon. We could go on forever naming the the people that Mick has brought over those over, the, over those 40 years and who's, uh, who have contributed so much to our lives here. It's appropriate too that the Irish ambassador, Adrian O'Neill, has acknowledged Mick's achievements and we're all very grateful to him for doing that. Above all, we're grateful to Mick's family, to Maura and their three wonderful children, if that's still the word for them, uh, for making tonight possible. And we look forward to the 41st Bloomsday back wholly under mixed control next year. Over to the maestro with glass in hand. Hello, it's been a wonderful evening. 
Thank you very much.